You see those two girls? They're twins. Would you say they're biracial? I would say they're all of the one human race. Thank you very much. You had to think about that, though, didn't you? You're thinking, what am I going to say? She's going to catch me on this one. That's right. <laughs> These are girls are not biracial. They are mosaic. A mosaic is something new and beautiful that is made of many different elements. That's what these two girls are. We need to stop talking about biracial and multiracial, and we need to stop saying all members of all races are out there protesting. No, there's only one race out there protesting, and it's the human race. Jane Elliott is a civil rights activist and human origins educator from Iowa who has garnered international reception for her work on human relations. Dylan Glass is a conservative political activist from Houston who reached out to Jane to learn more about how she perceives the world and how we as human beings can deliver on her mission of one race. Hi, Jane. Hey there, are you Dylan Glass by any chance? Yes, I am. Are you able to hear me? You look great. I know it's been a long, a long few months with COVID and everything. How are you doing? I'm doing fine because I don't have COVID. But COVID isn't our main problem either. Our main problem is the kind of leadership we have at the national level. Right. There are some things you can't get a test for and you can't get a vaccination for. And that's bad leadership. Right. Okay, I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint that I put together. I'm going to go to the uh, one, one question I have for you is, is what do you think individuals can do to take action in their communities now? I know we have an election coming up. What can people do to get involved and, and start changing the conversation and the direction we're facing? Go out and find every person who is, who is old enough to vote and doesn't have a car and take them to the polls. Take them to the polls and if they aren't going to vote for the right person, take them to the polls anyway. But we all need to vote. And then if you don't know what to do after that, go to my website, jane at janeelliot.com, download the printed learning materials. The first page is a set of typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist. The second page is the clarification of those statements. The third page is a page of commitments to combat racism, 18 things you can do in your own environment to deal with your own problem. Now somebody's going to say, but racism is a societal problem. Well, societies are made of individuals. And if we individuals decide not to have this anymore, we can put a stop to this racism. Racism is a learned response. Nobody's born a bigot. You have to be taught how to be a bigot, and I know how to teach that, and I know how to teach against that. And we must re-educate the educators so that they, too, teach against racism. This is absolutely essential. Great, great point. I completely agree. Uh, what, what advice uh, would you give the present and future leaders on, bringing, um, on bridging the racial divide going on in our country right now? What advice would you give to lawmakers? What advice would you give to activists on how we can change policy in this country? What advice would I give to our present leader? Resign. What advice would I give to future leaders? Don't do anything that this leader has done. Put back in place the things that Barack Obama put in place and let this country grow instead of diminish. And ever since for the last three and a half years, this country has diminished in every way, absolutely every way we have to get back to where we were before this person got in office. I would advise every person who is, on, who is a, pres a principal or a superintendent of a school system to read the book, at least read the book, The Racial Conditioning of Our Children. You see this? The Racial Conditioning yeah. of Our Children. We have, we have to read this book and you'll realize what's happening in the schools. The subtitle is, Ending psychological genocide in the schools. What we are committing in the schools in this country today and have been committing for the last 300 years is psychological genocide. When you tell a black child that he can't read, he can't learn because he's black, that's the teacher's fault, not the child's fault. If we would stop forcing children to live down to our expectations of them instead of raising our expectations of them, we could be a different kind of country. And, and we've got to stop teaching <laughs> But there are several different races. We've got to stop referring to groups of people as there are several different races in that protest. No, 
There's only one race of people on the face of the earth, and that's the human race. We are all descendants of those first modern human beings who evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. Every person on the face of the earth, every single one, is a descendant of those first black people. Get over it. We're all members of the same race. And if you don't believe it, have your DNA traced back as far as you can trace it. And every one of you listening to this or watching this or throwing a fit about this will find out a, par a percentage of your DNA comes from a country in Africa because we are all descendants of those first black modern human beings. It's time to get over the idea of several different races. How, how vastly different do you think our nation would look today um, if Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had not been assassinated? Well, if they hadn't been assassinated, if those two men and their, their followers had gotten together, they would have changed the economic situation in this country within a year. It would have been vastly different and vastly better than it is now. But you see, the reason they were killed is there was that, there was that danger that they might get together. Everybody need, needs to read the book, Malcolm and Martin and America and realize what they wanted, what they were working for, and why they had to die. If you think that uh, the person who is accused of killing either one of them is the only person who is guilty, you need to look at this society. This society, the people in this society, particularly now, white people, we call them white people, they aren't really white people. Uh, there's people who are suffering from melanesia, which is having too little melanin in your skin. Those people are scared to death because they know that the demographics of this society say that within 30 years, white people will be in, in a numerical minority in this country. And so we have a leader, a so-called leader right now, who is doing everything he can to see to it that the number of white people in this country grows. And one of the things he is doing is closing Planned Parenthood clinics because he's quite certain that all Planned Parenthood clinics do is offer abortions to white women. He's wrong. They do a number of wonderful things for women who need special help. Abortion is not the thing they offer most often. <laughs> and if you think I'm wrong about that, you need to know that in 1987, 60% of the abor aborted fetuses every year were white. And two years ago, only 39% of the aborted fetuses are, were white. So you see, he's getting away with what he wanted to do, which is slow down the number of white abortions, therefore, therefore increase the number of white babies born. He also said, just a, oh, about three years ago, we need to put a wall across the southern border of the United States because we can't let all those brown-skinned people in. And he said, brown-skinned people uh, reproduce too rapidly. We've got to keep those brown-skinned people out of here. He said, we're going to build a wall to see to that only Americans come into to America. Somebody needs to tell him that everybody from the northernmost point on Canada to the southernmost point in South America is an American. They're North Americans, they're Central Americans, they're South Americans, but they're all Americans. Is he gonna keep them all out? <laughs> He's gonna have a hard time with the Canadians and they're gonna make a big, they're making a big mistake when they try to keep out the brown skinned people from Central America and South America. They are extremely valuable people, extremely valuable workers, extremely brilliant people, and we are going to keep them out and only employ people that look like Donald Trump. That's the biggest mistake I've ever heard of. One of the things I've read in the Washington Post was the statistic that Planned Parenthood had given that 97% of what they do is not abortion, but they gave that statistic three Pinocchios. And I also read a study saying last year that more uh, black uh, fetuses were aborted than born alive. Do you believe that there are some in the abortion industry that target minorities and to plan their, their uh, clinics outside of high schools and minority communities, do you, what, do you, what is your response to people who, who have that uh, belief? I, have I was asked to address a group of um, midwives, midwives a couple months, about a year ago. And I said, why do you want me to talk to midwives? I was delivered of four children in five years, but I didn't deliver them myself. I don't know anything about medicine. And the woman said, that's not what we want you to talk about. We want you to talk to us because we are all registered nurses. We have become midwives because we know that black and brown women don't get the same treatment in delivery rooms that white women do. 
and we want to be sure that we deliver the baby so that every person, every woman is treated fairly. Now that you see is be that's after any abortion and before they go to school, they are being treated unfairly in the delivery room. If they don't leave the delivery room, that's not the fault of those black, those black mothers. That's the fault of doctors who have been taught that the whiter you are, the brighter you are. And that's the reason those things are happening to black women and black babies. I don't doubt those statistics for a minute. I wish I did. I wish I thought that we really believed in what we talk about in the Constitution. But we don't. We say those things, but we also remember that the people that we enslaved in this country were only considered three-fifths of a person, I think, when they wrote the Constitution. Think about that. Think about the people you know who are of different color groups, same race, all the same race, but we have bought into the idea of several different races, and we're using that to determine who has the right to live or who has to die in this country. This is terrifying as far as I'm concerned. How do you believe, do you believe we should have um, ICE and, and borders? How do you believe we should keep track of who's in the country and who's not? Well, I think if you're gonna keep track of who's in the country, <laughs> here comes a really ugly subject. Uh, we're talking about reparations for black people. Before you do that, you have to give reparations to Native Americans and let them look into all our backgrounds and let them decide who should come into this country. How many of you of, of us do you think they'd have let in? Not very many. <laughs> no, no, they'd have taken one look at those pale faces and said, if they were of the same idiotic behavior and thought processes that some of us are, they'd have said, you can't come, you're the wrong color. That would have made a whole lot of us really uncomfortable, wouldn't it? But then we might not have that person in the White House. How much progress have you seen over the decades since your activism began uh, 50 years ago? Do you, do you think we're going in the right direction? Are you optimistic about the future and future generations in America? I thought when Barack Obama was elected president that maybe, maybe it was going to be all right and I wouldn't have to do that exercise anymore and I wouldn't have to give any more speeches about the ignorance of racism. And then eight years after he did some really remarkable things and was stopped by people like Mitch McConnell from doing the things that he needed to do and wanted to do, and they refused to let him do. Mitch McConnell said before he got elected, he'll never get elected. Well, he did. Then he said, he'll never get reelected. Well, he did. He couldn't keep him down, so he waited. And the, the racists went underground until they got a chance to vote for somebody who would support their needs and support their nastiness. We were in better shape 10 years ago than we are today. Today we are in worse shape than we were in 1968. Because in 1968, people still cared. And people were opposed to what was going on. And people were talking about it and they were marching about it and they were trying to make a difference. And they did make some really remarkable changes in those years. But then, it, with the stroke of a pen, this person has, with executive orders, has undone most of what Barack Obama did that was right and hasn't done anything else that's right. He hasn't done anything right yet. And you, you, can't, you can't make the racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, ethnocentric statements that he's make, making and call yourself president of the United States and the president of everyone because he obviously doesn't want to be considered the president of everyone. He wants this country to be all white. Well, I've got news for him. <laughs> it, it hasn't been. It won't be, and there's no such thing as a white person. There are no white people on the face of the earth unless you are in Tanzania and you're, you suffer from albinism. Everybody else on the face of the earth is, has some melanin in their skin, so in their bodies. So get over it, people. There are no white people. You can see the color of my shirt, right? And what color is right. it? White. White, yeah. Well, then what color is my skin? If my shirt's white, what color is my skin? White. Would you call me a white person? <laughs> my skin isn't white. My skin is a shade of brown, just like everybody else's is. And if you think I'm crazy about that, look at this. In the, in the National Geographic magazine, have you seen this? This is there about 70 people here. Well, there are about 70 people on, this, on these pages. And each of them has a number underneath their picture because they are all colors on the Pantone color wheel. 
and they have 70 different colors on that because there are at least that many different shades of brown among human beings on the face of the earth. We are all members of the human race. There are very, I've only seen one person, she was on television yesterday, who is pretty white, but not white, but she's pretty close. What, what would you say uh, to someone that supported someone like Ben Carson or, or Herman Cain for president? You know, they're willing to vote for a black president. They, they don't believe themselves to be racist, but they, they feel that the government was growing too large um, and that they wanted to see a, a reduction in the size of the federal government and federal government overreach. And they believe strongly in states' rights. Uh, what, do you, what is your response to someone in that category? Well, if you're talking about Ben Carson, you need to take another look. If you want to talk about excellence in medicine, you need to take another look. If you want to talk about fairness and freedom and liberty and justice for all, you better look in a different direction. This country no longer believes in liberty and justice for all. It believes in liberty for some and justice for just us. And that means just white folks. I, you're, <laughs> you cannot, you can, I've, I've talked to several people in the last six weeks who are black and who are opposed. And when I, they, they talk about reparations. And when I say, uh, if we're gonna give reparations to every, everybody that we've undone or that we've done dirt, dirt to, I think we need to start with Native Americans, don't you? And they explode on me and say, those black men say the same things about Native Americans and how they've got all the good stuff and we've given them all they need and we've, they've got the good jobs. They go into the same rigmarole that white males do when I talk about fair treatments for blacks. So here we are, it depends on whose ox is being gored, doesn't it? If you talk right. about reparations for Native Americans, you can't talk about reparations for blacks until you give reparations to Native Americans. And that makes some black people just furious. But you need to realize they're all, we're all members of the same race. And if it's fair for black people, then it's fair for Native Americans. And it's fair for Asians. And it's fair for all of those who are of varied colors. It's even fair for pale faces. But pale faces haven't treated any other color group right. I remember during the Second World War when Asians, Japanese Americans, were put in concentration camps out on the desert, and that's where they lived for the duration of the war. I worked with Pat Okura, who was a Japanese American, and he talked about what happened to them when, when the Second World War started. In 1970, when we were on the White House Conference on Children and Youth, he helped to get the law passed that said there would be no more Japanese, con Japanese American concentration camps. It took that long, from 1945 to 1970. Do you see something wrong with that? I thought it was dreadful, and so did Pat Okura. Pat Okura was a brilliant man, but he was Japanese, so he had, he had to carry the burden of being Japanese and having his country fought, fighting in the Second World War. He had to carry that burden practically until he died. It makes me furious. He wasn't the one who started the war. He, didn't, he wasn't a, a member of the, the military. He wasn't the one who did the bombing. And I wonder how long it will take us to punish the people who dropped two bombs on Japan later on. Two atomic bombs. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All those Asian Americans, all those Japanese people who weren't Americans, so it was all right to kill them. 100,000 one night. See, we have a we have a lot to to answer for before we start abusing other people on the basis of how they treat one another, an awful lot. I remember when Franklin Roosevelt said before the Second World War started, somebody asked him, "What are you going to do about Hitler?" He said, "Leave that man alone. He's dealing with a problem the rest of us don't want to deal with." Whoa! Wait a minute. That's not what we learned about Franklin Roosevelt, but that's what he said. We need to be aware that we learn racism from our leaders. And when you have a leader like this one, we learn it rather rapidly and it'll take us a long time to get over it. Do you believe you'll see the first female president in your lifetime at all? We've had a lot of women running, Elizabeth Warren, you know, we, Hillary was the nominee in 2016. Do you think we're ever going to be ready for a female president in, in your lifetime? If, if it, well, how long do you think I'm gonna live? Be careful I, I think now. You, Be careful now. I've seen it. I've seen <laughs> it happen. Well, if 
if our if our new president, which we'll have a new president, we will have a new president after November, after the elections this year, we'll have a new president. And if that man chooses Susan Rice as his running mate, that brilliant woman, if he chooses her as his running mate, she could very easily handle the job of the presidency of the United States. There's no doubt in my mind of what that woman is the one who should be run, who should be the vice president and should run for the presidency in four years. She's absolutely brilliant and she knows it all. She's been there, she's, she's, she knows the problems, she knows the solutions, and she's an extremely valuable human being. Something a conservative commentator, Dinesh D'Souza, has stated before, I don't know if you've ever seen any of his movies, but that um, pivotal leaders of the abolitionist and anti-slavery movements, uh, such as Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Booker T. Washington, and Harriet Tubman, uh, he, he says they're often ignored and not promoted due to their political ideology. Do you find this, these statements to be accurate? What is your belief on why we don't hear more about these figures in our school and our education system? We don't do more about those figures and uh, our schools because of our ignorance. Because instead of offering education in the schools of this country, in this country, we're offering indoctrination. We teach people, little kids from kindergarten up and now from the age of three up, how to be good United States of America citizens. We don't teach them how to be citizens of the world. We teach them how to practice the kind of patriotism that we have practiced, which is, if you're right, you're all right. If you're brown, hang around. If you're black, you get back. And if you're red, you're dead. That's what we teach in the schools. And right now, right now, somebody I talked to today said, uh, we have to get these statues that they're taking down. How awful to take down those statues. But on the other hand, maybe it's a good idea. Wait a minute. How often to show John Wayne movies all every week, every weekend? How often to show Western movies that show killing Native Americans time after time after time? I'm less concerned with Dawn with the Wind, which we all know is a period movie and told what was happening at that time, but isn't supposed to be happening anymore. I'm less concerned with that than I am with week after week after week of John Wayne killing people of color and spanking women. Give me a break. During your uh, appearance on Oprah, uh, you used the N-word and making a really bold and sharp point. It was well received at the time. I was reading some of the comments today and some people were saying they felt it was uncomfortable hearing it from you uh, now and that it was inappropriate. Do you feel as if though you said it today and making a sharp point um, that you would be called out for it? I know there's professors that have used it in an educational moment, have been called to resign. Do you think people would target you today um, if you use it in, a, in an example, making a point, an educational statement? I think you have to say it the way it was said. I think you have to, people have to hear it the way it was said. People have to realize how ignorant and how ugly that sounds. But if you think for one minute that there are not a whole lot of pale-faced males in this country using that word today, you're mistaken. And if you think that taking it out of our lexicon is going to change their feeling, you're wrong. People all over this country are using that, uh, about 30% of us, of them, are still using that word. Yes, it was unfortunate that I used that word, but that was what was used in my classroom at that time. And the, the point of doing the exercise and the point of using, of seeing the exercise and seeing the film is to let people know how ignorant we are, those of us who think we're all right because we're white. The people seem to forget that when I do that exercise, blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, I do in my classroom for one day, what we have been doing in this country for 300 years. I pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control. I assign negative traits to those who have the wrong physical characteristic. I treat them as badly as we, not as badly, but I treat them badly because of that physical characteristic. Now, we do that with blacks and brown people and First Nations people and Asians if they aren't careful. We do that with them all day long. When I do the exercise in the classroom, that's one person doing the exercise. It is going, it's only in that classroom, no other teacher is involved in it. It's only those kids 
and that teacher, it's over at the end of the day. And they all know it's going to be over at the end of the day. There is no physical violence encouraged by the person in that situation. However, and they, they get, it's over when they go home. How long do you think it's going to be before black children who get that treatment all day, every day on the basis of the teacher's ignorance about school co skin color, how long do you think it's going to be before they can say, it's over, I just had it one day, I never have to have it again. And it was only one person, and it was only in that, in, in that environment. No, no, I'll never forget the black man who said to me, if you could promise me that I'd only have one day of discrimination based on the color of my skin, I'd take that day. I take one day out of my life. Yeah, but you see, white people don't even have to take one day. And people say to me, oh my God, I get all these calls and these letters and like anger from people who say, how could you do that to those poor little white children? And I say, and don't you think you have traumatized them? Don't you think that's traumatic? And I say, wait a minute. If you're upset about what happens to those poor little white children for one day with one teacher in one building, in one school uh, schoolroom, you must be absolutely infuriated by what happens to children of color all day, every day, from the moment they're born until the moment they die. And every one of them says, and this is just, it's like they all, they're all reading off the same script. That's different, they're used to it, they can take it. After I've done the exercise in a corporation, and I, I, and I put the brown people, blue people, you know, side by side, so that we integrate the room. And I say, what do you think about what happened today? And the, invariably, some white woman turns to the black woman beside her and says, that was too rough. I don't think anybody should have to do that. And the person of color says, what about us? We do it all day. And invariably, the white woman says, that's different. You're used to it. You can take it. I'm not used to that kind of thing. Think about that. In other words, it's all right for you because we've made you accept it. It's not all right for me because I shouldn't have, I should never have to be treated that way. The main fear that white people has, have today is the knowledge that within 30 years, they will have become a numerical minority in the United States of America. And that's the reason white folks are getting really, really angry. And that's the reason we have a border wall on the southern border of the United States. And that's the reason we are trying to do with plan, uh, do away with Planned Parenthood clinics, because we want to increase the number of white babies and decrease the number of people of color. I think this is the end of my slide. I just want to thank you again here. I'm not, I, I want to ask a few more questions, but I just want to remind people that they can go to your website at uh, janeelliot.com and you have some great resources and great products, um, shirts and books. And I hope people will visit your website as well. They all have to read this magazine. The National Geographic Magazine for April of 2018. You see those two girls? They're twins. Would you say they're biracial? I would say they're all of the one human race. Thank you very much. You had to think about that though, didn't you? You're thinking, what am I gonna say? She's gonna catch me on this one. That's right. <laughs> These are, girls are not biracial, they are mosaic. A mosaic is something new and beautiful that is made of many different elements. That's what these two girls are. We need to stop talking about biracial and multiracial, and we need to stop saying all members of all races are out there protesting. No, there's only one race out there protesting, and it's the human race. And if we want to do away with some of the racism in the schools, we'd better start using this map instead of the one they've been using in the schools for the last 300 years. Are you familiar with the Peter's projection map? I, I saw a video that you uh, that was out where you discussed the, the sizing of the map and how it was inaccurate. Can you explain again how they made Greenland uh, Greenland bigger than it was actually, uh, how they depicted it incorrectly for everyone? And the Mercator map was done in the 1600s, and it was done to show the spread of Christianity. On that map, get a picture in your mind of what that first map you ever saw on the wall looked like. You see Greenland hanging down there like a great big red plum in the middle of that map? Right. Not in this one, but the one who's, yeah, okay. But in, on this map, on which the, the sizes are distorted, but the shapes and the locations are right. Here's a little Greenland up here. On the bottom of the Mercator map in the legend, it says, South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Now you get a picture of the Mercator map in your mind. Does South America look nine times larger than Greenland for you on that map? 
Absolutely not, but it does here. South America is nine times larger than Greenland. This is an important difference. People of the Boston schools are using this map in their classrooms now as a result of watching that on the Oprah, on the Oprah Winfrey show. We could change the way children see their world if we would show them the truth instead of the lie. I, um, I want to talk about Planned Parenthood one more time. Things that Margaret Singer had said in the past about eliminating black people like weeds and, you know, hiring black pastors to teach, um, to, to recruit people in the Planned Parenthood. Do you have any thoughts on that? Does Planned Parenthood target minority communities? You might have already discussed this already, but what, do you have any other thoughts on that? I have watched Planned Parenthood protests. And it seems to me that most of the protests are in white neighborhoods, not in black neighborhoods. And I lived in Waterloo, Iowa, so which was called Little Chicago because of the large black population. And I watched things happen to black people that we wouldn't have dared to do to white people. Wouldn't have dreamed of it. Would have been seriously in big trouble if we had done it. But because they're black, it doesn't matter. Because they're black, we need to have them gone. We are terribly frightened. And they, we now know now that we are going to be in the minority. We've got to start, well, number one, we've got to start telling the truth about black people. We've got to read Anthony Browder's book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. If you haven't read it, get it and read it. And you will realize that when we have, we teach black history for one month in the schools in the United States of America. And one, one, one month of education is 20 days maybe for half an hour a day. <laughs> you figure that's enough to cover black history? Black history started 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. You need to read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization before you even start to write this nonsense about those black people and about black history. If we're gonna start, to, if we're gonna teach black history in the schools, we won't have time for white people, white history because we're all cousins of those black people, those first black people. We are all members of the same race. You and I are 30th to 50th cousins. Now you might not like having me for a cousin, but you're stuck with me. That's the way it is. We're all, we're members of, according to the Bible, the family of man. That's you and me. Make no mistake about that. And, and every person on the face of the earth. What are, what are your thoughts on, Aunt, I, I don't, you've probably seen it already, Aunt Jemima Syrup is, you know, they're removing her image from it. Should it be called Nancy Green syrup? What do you think? How, does, how should they approach <laughs> this now? <laughs> I think you should take the picture off the label because an ant can be any color. Come on, take the picture off the label and you won't have to worry about it. People won't have okay. that picture. And if they don't have that picture in their minds, you know, like the map, change the map. If people don't have that ugly picture in their minds, they can think something else when they look at that. I don't think people buy Aunt Jemima because there's a picture of a black woman on there, and I don't think they not don't buy it because of that. I think they buy it for the syrup, not for the advertising. I, I think about uh, ten years ago, I was having breakfast, and I was I was studying the bo the bottle, and I you know I asked my mom about it, and I said, what what is the history behind this this syrup imaging? Because even as a as a child, if you're not paying attention, you you kind of miss things. And I never realized because I, I I've forgotten about it and I hadn't seen it in years, and I you know I started looking it up and I was reading about Nancy Green, and you know there was some conflict there where they said she wasn't even paid for the the use of her imaging over the years. Her family didn't receive payment. They should certainly receive the payment if her image was used you know for the marketing purposes. And then I, it seems like the more you look at things, the more you will find, especially in advertising, is that things are marketed a certain way. You know, Absolutely. To of different, they different are. Uh, groups. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, as far as we feel like we've come, if you look at things, you know, this, I remember how in the, the Oprah episode, you were told you didn't smile enough. But I thought, you know, if, if Jane, if you were a, a man, if you were a man, that would have been perfectly fine. And yet still today in politics, women are always told all the time, you didn't smile enough, you didn't smile right. It's like things have become more veiled in a certain way, but the, the messaging behind it is still there.
things have changed because I remember when television first, remember, I remember, you see, I'm older than dirt. So I remember things that most people don't remember. I remember when television started and every commercial was black, was white males in positions of power. Even when it came to cleaning the stool, the toilet bowl, a man's, a woman would be doing the work and a man's voice would come out of the woodwork and tell her what product to use. And I used to think, wait a minute, if you know so much about it, cool, why don't you clean the darn dog dog on stool? No, but it was, they seem, they seem to have, uh, um, uh, the, they seem to have all the power and none of the responsibility, which I thought was really kind of interesting. Now, and you never saw a black woman or black man in a, on a commercial. Now, I'm seeing increasing numbers of people of color on commercials, which says something. It says that the people who have products to sell realize who their customer, what their customer base is going to be in the future, and they're starting to appeal to that customer base as well as to white women and white men. I think that's a big step in the right direction. And we have stopped until, until George Floyd and that ugly, ugly situation happened. We didn't show people being badly treated, as badly treated as we do now. But now we have no choice. We have to show it because a lot of people have cameras. I'm sorry, I have to call later. They have cameras and they're out there, right out there, they, with their cell phones, taking pictures of the ugly things that are happening. They, right. Those pictures weren't on television until now. And they wouldn't be on television now if it weren't for somebody who has no, had, had no bone to pick, had no, wasn't doing it to be mean, just was taking a picture of something ugly that was happening. And it got all over the news, finally. But that didn't, I don't think that surprised black people. I think they know that those things have been happening to black males for about 300 years in this country. Now we're upset because we're seeing it right there in front of our eyes. And still, the people who are describing it say, well, there are people of all races in these protests. No, there aren't people of all races in these protests. There are all people, there are people of all different colors, different gender, genders, different gender orientations, different religions, different nationalities, different cultural groups, but they aren't all people of all races. We've got to change our vocabulary. We are trying to use information from the 15th and 16th century to solve problems in the 21st century. And instead of solving the problems, we're making them worse because we're trying to use the same things that we did in 16 and 1700. It didn't work then, and it certainly won't work now because white men had the power then, they're losing power every day. So it isn't going to work now. We need to change our behavior and change our language and change our social studies in the schools because what we're teaching is anti-social studies. But I'm yeah, not you, you, you mentioned how people have been uh, been filming events lately, and some of the some of the jokes people will say is, you know, they they label people as Karens who who often call the police on black people in parks. Um, people use the term boomers sometimes as a comedic insult. And there are some in the there's some news stories, opinion pieces where people try to say that saying Karen or saying boomer is the new N word. What do you think about that? Isn't that because you know people have never Karen is just a joke, and for people to say it's the new N word, N word has a long history of abuse and of deep meaning. For people to make that comparison, what does that say about society today that they think? A, a jokingly calling someone a Karen for making a scene in public is the same as using the N-word to someone who's black. Until the Karens have been treated the way the blacks have, they better sit right. down and shut up because the yep. two things are not the same. You know, and I know that the reason I'm allowed to run my mouth is because I'm old, I'm white, and I'm female. And so people will listen to me. If a black woman had done that exercise in her classroom in 1968, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, she wouldn't just have lost her job, she might have lost her life. Now, I've been threatened with death lots of times. I've been hit by a white male during that exercise. I've had a knife pulled on me. <laughs> they rushed me out of Uniontown, Pennsylvania at midnight one night. Three carloads of blacks did because the teachers that I'd put through the exercise in a very informal way in the morning called the superintendent and said, if you don't get that bitch out of town, we're going to shoot her. 
And they were absolutely serious. So they, they proved your point, I think. <laughs> they proved absolutely. your point. They, they proved my point. point. And, yeah. And, and it, it didn't, I wasn't afraid. I didn't know what was going on until we got to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And then I said to the woman who was driving, what's going on here? And she told me what had happened. I said, I wouldn't have minded staying to see if they were going to make good on their threat. She said, we couldn't afford to have you killed in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. So we went on to, to Harrisburg and I did my thing the next day. I was afraid that night, but the next morning when I got up, after I worked in the afternoon with a, a group of students, and I looked out at the <laughs> motel, two-story motel, and there were windows and doors, glass all around me, and I thought, behind one of those windows is the, could be the person who was sent here to kill me. Right. And at that point, I was frightened for a minute, and then I thought, wait a minute, you can stay here and be paralyzed with, with fear, never do this work again, or you can walk out to go to the checkout, go to the desk and check out and go home. And so I stiffened my shoulders because I guess I thought if your muscles were stiff enough, the bullets would bounce off. And I walked quickly. <clears throat> I didn't run because I, I think you don't run because you're scared. I think you're scared because you run. You get the adrenaline moving and then you're in trouble. So I walked quickly to the desk and I got to the desk and I thought, well, look at here. You just allowed them <clears throat> to scare you damn near to death. I'll never do that again. You can never scare me again. If somebody wants to shoot me, and I say to those three boys sitting in the second or third row when I'm on a college and they're all wearing that cap, that red cap, on which it says, make America hate again. It says, make America great again, but it means make America hate again. Make no mistake about that. And they're talking and pointing at me. And I stop what I'm saying. I say, look, fellas, I know what you're talking about. You'd like to see me dead because of what I'm trying to do to decrease the level of racism in this country. You can kill me. That's fine. Go ahead. But if you do, you need to remember that you might make a martyr out of me, and then you might have to spend the rest of your lives celebrating Jane Elliott Day once a year. Do you want to do that? And they go, no, 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 right. no. I say, fine, thanks. Yeah. Very good. Now, <laughs> shut up yeah. and listen. And then they shut up and listen, because all the blacks in the room have turned and looked at them and given them the look that the people in the maximum security prison gave to the white males one day when I worked at a maximum security prison. They just gave one look to those fools, and those white convicts get scooted down in their seats and shut their mouths. And that's the fear of white people in this country right now, is people of color are going to want to get even with us. And, it, and the, I was on a panel with, <laughs> on the stage with Angela Davis a year or so ago, and some white woman down in the audience said, well, if those people get power, aren't they going to want to do, aren't they going to, going to want to get even with us? Aren't they going to want to do what we've done to them? I said, that's, that's your problem, right? Yes, I'm afraid they want to get even. I said, okay, let's find out. So I said to the room, 1,500 people in that auditorium, and half of them black. I said, well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself black and wants to get even with all white folks, please stand. Three young black males stood. The rest of them just looked at him like, are you crazy? And I said, see, they don't want to get even with all of us. And that white woman, like, oh, she was so glad. I said, but now, let's be honest about this. Well, every black person in this audience who wants to get even with one or two white people, please stand. Every one of those black people stood up, every one of them cheering and laughing and high-fiving one another and tickled to death. And I said, see, there's the answer. They don't want to get even with all of us. If you don't want people of color to get, want to get even with you in the future, don't be the one or two that they want to get even with. Treat people fairly, and you won't be one of the one or two. Do you understand that? And she was, well, yeah, I mean, the black said, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. We need to change our behaviors toward people who are different from ourselves because they are members of my race, and those are my cousins. And I get really angry when ignorant pale faces abuse my cousins because my ignorant pale, fa my pale faces ignorance about skin color. Marketing campaign logos such as um, campaign slogans such as "Make America Great Again." It's been used before with uh, Bill Clinton said it in the 90s, and he used it in a radio ad for Hillary in 2008. Ronald Reagan's used it before. What do, What do you think it, was the meaning behind it then to people in in the early 90s, 2008, in the 80s? What did "Make America Great Again" mean to people then? Well. Ronald Reagan said he wanted to take us back to the 50s. Those were the good old days, the 50s. While he was in the same speech in which he said that, he talked about in, uh, Washington, D.C., the United States, a shining city on a hill. And I thought, fool, aren't you going to admit that the hill, the city is built 
on the bones of black and brown men. No, he wouldn't admit that, and he would never say that. A shining city on a hill. And we're going to make America like it was in the 50s. It was really good for white males. It wasn't worth a damn for the rest of us. Furthermore, you need to realize that America is not just the 48 contiguous states, Alaska and Hawaii and the islands. America is everything from the northernmost point of Canada to the southernmost point of, the, of South America. Let's start calling this the United States of America or admit that America is a whole lot bigger than we want to believe. We're gonna build a wall to keep out Americans? Oh, give me a break. <laughs> that's, that's gonna be a pretty good trick, trick isn't it? When, when um, one study I read was that the, they traveled through America, uh, through the United States of America, through Mexico and other countries. It has some of the highest rates of rape, 90% of women are raped making that, making that travel. Uh, I'm missing to the all United later. States of America. And, um, you know, we, we have a national security threat with terrorism and things, situations with our health and, and diseases passing through. How can, we, how can we manage boundaries? You know, Mexico has a kind of a southern wall. What, what do we do? What is your solution for immigration reform and to how we can make the system work for everyone, but at the same time have safety boundaries? Well, I'm glad that the First Nations people didn't believe in immigration reform because there wouldn't be many white folks here, would there? And I think right. that we need to control the, we need to control our, our citizens, our, our population. But I think we need to control it not on the basis of ignorance about skin color, but on the basis of, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, not the color of our skin, but the content of our character. And if we were judging people on the content of our, their character, Mr. Trump's father would never have been allowed to immigrate to this country. Now think about that. We, we let people in because this is the land. <laughs> Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse from your teeming shores and these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I left my lamp beside the golden door. No, what we mean is, give me your wealthy, your energetic, send them here and we'll put them to work. However, if the jobs they're doing are no longer jobs that we need done, we will put them back, send them back where they came from. And if they are little brown children on the southern border of the United States, it's all right for us to keep them in a prison situation because their parents wanted to have a better life and brought them to this country. So now they are in what amounts to concentration camps. Tell me how what a wonderful country we have, con we have constructed in the last three and a half years. Take little brown-skinned people. The president says we can't let those brown-skinned people in here. They reproduce too rapidly. Now, five and seven and 10 and 12-year-olds aren't going to reproduce too rapidly. Their parents are trying to bring them to a place that is better than what they came from. That is the reason for practically every person who emigrated to this country over the years, is to get into a better situation. This, this country has been a, it was good for my great, great, great grandparents were Irish and probably came to this country because they were probably breaking laws in the country from which they came. But they were okay because they looked all right. And they were nice enough people. But I know what they're all about. And then you think about Australia, which people from Europe had turned into a prison camp for people who had broken laws, they'd sent them to Australia. And those are the kind of people who were going to change the, the le level of civilization in Australia. Convicted criminals, think about that. They weren't good enough to live in their homeland, so we send them to Australia to do a job on people of color. I talked to an Australian person this morning, and he thinks that what has gone on there and what is going on there now is very similar to what happens here. And he's right, it is. I've worked in Australia five times. And that's exactly what we did then, they are doing now. We set, we, we give a perfect example of how to treat those who are different from yourself, and it's wrong. We know, we know the difference. We know what's right. Why don't we do what's right? Uh, President Trump often talks about um, 
you know, he'll say the lowest unemployment for African Americans, for Hispanics. He'll he'll pitch, you know, that it's all about putting America first and all Americans of different creeds. You know, people will say his wife's an immigrant. <laughs> You know, what is your what is your response to those arguments people make that say, you know, he's not really racist, but maybe sometimes he uses race to kind of rally some people together for votes. What do you think about about that? Do you are you convinced completely that he he is racist? What do you think? What what is your response to that? Do you think that he would have gotten selected by the electoral college members in four states if they hadn't been racist because I don't think he would have and furthermore he didn't get elected he got selected by the by the electoral college members in four states four states who voted against what is right and voted for what is wrong and that's why he is where he is and he's perfectly comfortable being called a racist because he is proud of it. He is proud of being a racist because he doesn't know what that word means and he doesn't realize that there's only one race. And he will, pretty soon, he's gonna catch on to white privilege and then the, then the roof's gonna fall in on him because right now, a whole bunch of people are running around the country talking about white privilege. There's a wonderful list of white privileges. I can do all these things because of my race. I can buy a house where I want to because of my race. I can buy a little because of my race. Well, the person who wrote that list has, had forgotten, evidently, that there's only one race. And if I can do those things because of my race, which is really the color of my skin, then everybody else can do those things, too, have those rights, too, because we're all members of the same race. That list has to be rewritten, and we have to start talking about pale face ignorance instead of white privilege. What do, you, what do you think we should do with the Electoral College? I, should we go to a popular vote system? Or do you think we should do something kind of in the middle where we don't have winner take all states so that, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a Democrat in Texas, you, there's some Electoral College vote there for you. And if you're a Republican in California, there's some Electoral College uh, going into uh, your vote. What do you think should be done with the Electoral College to make it a system that works better towards how people vote across the entire country? I, I think it has to be changed, but I'm not a politician and I'm not a legislator and I don't know how to do it, but I think it has to be changed. And I think this last election, during which Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump did, but he got the presidency because of the electoral college votes in four states. That is absolutely ridiculous. We all knew that he didn't have the skills, the intelligence, the knowledge, or the, or the background or experience to be president of the United States. We knew it before, and we sure as the devil know it now. They made a big mistake, and so we're on the edge of losing our democracy. I don't think that would have happened with Hillary Clinton, as misled as she oftentimes was. She wasn't misled, which is what we are dealing with now. We are being led by a myth, and the myth is a lie. And we need to realize that that's what's happening, and we need to guarantee that it doesn't happen again. And if it takes abolishing the Electoral College in the next five months, I don't think we're gonna get it done. So what we have to do is in absolutely, if you have a car and you're old enough to drive, you find people who want to vote and can't get to the polls and pick them up and take them to the polls and make sure you get everybody registered and then take people to the polls. And if they aren't voting the way you want them to, at least give them a chance to, to, have, to vote. That's not what's going to happen if this fool has his way. We're going to fix it so that black people and older people don't get to vote in this country. We have to put a stop to this. Something uh, people say, and I, I wanted to get your in, insight on this, is that, you know, that I'll say Republican, Republican Party was always about, you know, civil rights and abolishing slavery and, you know, ending Jim Crow laws and uh, that the Democrat Party, you know, has always been been racist and that they 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 just hide it better now. What is your response? Is there ever a switch where the Democrat and Republican parties switch sides? Some, you know, people like Danessa Souza, who I mentioned earlier, say that's not the case. Um, 
that it's it, there was never a switch. What is your opinion on that? I don't have an opinion on that, but what I do know is that racism is a money-making product projection. Money, a project. I'm sorry. You can make money behaving in racist ways. Why would you give up something at which you can make a whole lot of money? And that's what we do with racism. We have corporations in this country who pay people of color less than they pay pale faces because they can and work them for less than 40 hours a week so they don't have to pay any of their benefits or insurance. Get a lot of work out of them for, out of them for a little money and if they complain, fire them and hire another person of color. They do it all the time. If you think I'm lying about that, you need to read the book Nickel and Dimed. And I can't remember the author's name, but read the book Nickel and Dimed. And you realize that that's exactly what corporations are doing in this country. And then you have the prison industrial complex. We put people in prison, usually the majority of them are black males. We put them in prison. We work them eight hours a day. We pay them two cents an hour, 20 cents an hour, I think it is. And their wages go to their, the victim. If you work a man eight hours a day and only furnish his, his clothing, his food, and his shelter, that's called slavery. We have reinstituted slavery in this country with the prison industrial complex. You need to be aware of that. We are once again making money off the backs of black males. We need to put a stop to that. If you look at the, our, the percentage of the people in this country in prisons, who are black, it is just astounding and it's shameful and it has to be stopped. You don't have to commit a crime to go to jail as a black man. All you have to do is get in the crosshairs of a white man with a badge. Or, or smoke marijuana or, or vape it or anything like that. They, any drug offenses, they, they take that and they, they lock you away, especially if you're someone of color. That seems to certainly but be something it, used. Isn't it interesting that they'll do that over smoking a joint, but I have a little pot of, it's not marijuana, it's something else, salve for my sore shoulders. I use it all the time and it's wonderful, but I can't have my daughter bring some back with her from California today. She's coming today, she's on her way now. I couldn't have her bring me some because if she got caught with it crossing state lines, she could have a horrible fine and might go to jail. Now, do you find right. any sense at all in that? One of the most marvelous, marvelous things for all of us health-wise is- Is it CBD? Marijuana. Oh, it is, yeah, okay. CBD, it's just wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. My you know, I've got a problem with my shoulders because old people do. But when I put that on, no problem. I'd like to be able to just go in, into Minnesota and buy some and bring back a great big pot of it. I don't want to smoke it, a pot of pot. No, I want to bring back a jar of CBD oil because it is so right. wonderfully for pain. But no, we can't do that because we've got these antiquated laws that we don't need anymore. We know better and we ought to stop doing it. I have just two more questions and then I'll let you go because I know you're busy. I want to go back to the Electoral College one more time. And let's say we have a situation where Trump wins the popular vote and, you know, pe people say, you know, they, they talk about flyover country and, and states like Iowa, there's, there's several states, I think Colorado is one, where they're using the, the state house, the state senate, the governor signed it into law where the popular vote, uh, whoever the popular vote goes to, it goes to the president. So if in a, in a strange scenario where Trump wins the popular vote, but Colorado uh, votes Democrat, they would then have to hand over their electoral college votes to, uh, to Donald Trump. Do you, are you concerned that states like, you know, big cities, big, big populated uh, areas, are they going to have too much of an impact over flyover country? What, how do we make it uh, to where every vote across the country uh, counts. And I know you said you weren't a legislator, so you may not have anything else to say about that, but do you have any more thoughts on, on that? I think that anybody, anybody, anybody who votes for Donald Trump after what he has done since January to this country is a damn fool. And I think you can't do anything about what they do, but you have to make them aware that if he should get reelected in November, it will be the fault of all of us 
and there be anyone who says to himself or herself, I'm not going to vote. I don't like either of the people who are running. That is just like giving a vote to that man. Every person in this country who is of voting age has to go to the polls and vote in a way that is good for this country. Not necessarily good for conservatives, not just good for, for liberals, not just good for blacks or good for whites or good for, not good for a group, but good for this country because as they keep saying, we're all in this together. Well, that sounds really good. But if you're a black person and your neighborhood and your area is being regentrified because they want to bring in better homes for middle-class white people in your area, the fact that we are living in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and we're all in this together, won't keep you from being ousted from your home in order to make space for more profit, for more profit and more, more correct white middle-class people. That's what's happening all over this country. Regentrification is just a code word for kick out the blacks. Well, now, that's what my do you opinion. think about? You may not agree with it, but that's what it looks like. And that's what it feels like. You've talked to people in those areas. I watched this happen in Denver, Colorado. Oh, oh from 1985 on, and I was working in Denver, Colorado. I watched them knock down a whole bunch of little old hotels in which little old men were living. And they forced those little old men out of those hotels, go find another place to live, so that they could build great big corporate bus buildings. This, this makes no sense. This makes, it's, it makes sense for the people with money, but there are a whole lot of people out there who have never been allowed to make enough money so that they could even leave an estate for their children because they've been too what busy working for low wages. What do you think about uh, the criminal justice reform that was passed and signed into law? I, I don't remember the date it was signed or what exactly the bill contained. Um, but I know people, liberals like Van Jones, praised it as an accomplishment. Do you, I, I, clearly, we still have more work to do, for sure. It's not the be-all, end-all, but do you think it was an improvement of where we need to go? I don't have an opinion because I don't haven't studied that. I really haven't. But any... <laughs> If we have what we call crim criminal justice, that's not justice and it's only criminal. What we call justice in this country is just for us. We might as well call it what it is. It's just us. And that means white folks. Something I see a lot of people wanting to know on Twitter and they, they want to hear your thoughts on is, do you have an opinion of Candace Owens? And what do you think, how do you think a discussion would go with her? Do you think you would have common ground with her or do you think you want to see eye to eye. I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. Um, and then I guess yep, I'm one if, more thing. If, she is, if she's a person, if she's a person of color, she would say in response to something I suggested today, what another black person said, you're a white person and you shouldn't be telling black people what to do. Don't be giving us your advice. I said, and I firmly believe that if the Black Lives Matter folks had said, Black Lives Matter too, that white people wouldn't be able to weaponize that statement. But as long as it says Black Lives Matter, you see when white people hear Black Lives Matter, they hear only Black Lives Matter. Well, that's not mm -hmm. what it means. It means Black Lives Matter too. And if they had put the word too on the end of that, that would have de-weaponized it for white people. White people could not fight it then. You have to think ahead when you're dealing with people like me. I know white people. I know how we think. I know how we don't think. And I know when we don't think. And we don't think when somebody, when our, when our noble leader tells us to think in negative ways about people of color, that's what 30% of us will do. And if we can make money following his lead, we'll do it with a smile on our face. Do you, um, do you think the police should be defunded? I know that's something kind of in the platform of what the organization itself wants to do. Is it possible to, to believe, you know, Black Lives Matter, I want to do everything I can for equality for one, one human race, but at the same time disagree with defunding the police? What is your thoughts there? Number one, you said all about equality, and we have to deal with that. I'm not equal to you, and I never will be. I'll never be as young as you are. I'll never be as strong as you are. I'll never be as tall as you are. 
You know that, and so do I. We will never be equal. The Constitution promises equal treatment under the law. It doesn't promise us equality. The only people in whose eyes we're equal is God's. And I believe in God, and I believe that in the eyes of God, we're all equal. Now, what was the question? Um, let me think. Uh, <laughs> oh, Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It was, it was, do you believe that... <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that people could support uh, black, could they believe Black Lives Matter but disagree with some of the, the organization itself and, and that they want to defund the police? Do you believe police should be defunded? How do, we, how, do we, how do we make sure a police don't abuse their power? I know we've talked about in the past body cams. We've talked about, um, you know, holding people accountable using technology. How do we, how do we, Where's the balance? Where's the balance and okay. how we can... Okay. Here's, here's what I think. You ask me what I think, so I'm going to tell you what I think. I think we, should, we could solve the whole problem by, in elementary school, instead of teaching the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, only one of which words begins with R, which is the word reading, instead of those three R's, I think in schools, from kindergarten on, we should be teaching the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility. Now that isn't what most policemen have learned. I think we should take the money that we're going to use, we're going to defund the police. I should I think we should take the money that we take out of that situation and put it into re-educating the members of the police force and the members of the city council and the mayor and the governor and the president. I think we should re-educate people to the fact that there's only one race and we are going to treat one another equitably. Period. And I think we should also teach the members of the police department, since they obviously don't believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Maybe it's time to teach them the platinum rule, which says do unto others as others would have you do unto them. Treat others the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated, because we white people don't treat people of color the way we want to be treated. We treat them the way we want to treat them, not the way they want to be treated. So if we all believed in the platinum rule, do unto others as others would have you do unto them, then we would have to ask them how they want to be treated. We would have to listen to the answer. And then if what they asked us to do wasn't indecent, illegal, or obscene, we would have to do it. And so we could practice their li our listening skills, listen to what other people want instead of telling them what they should want. Now I'm, I'm right now, I am, I am, uh, uh, not doing what I'm telling you to do. I'm telling you what to do. I'm telling you, treat people the way they want to be treated. Listen to what they say you tell you. We could do away with a whole lot of unpleasantness if we would just stop thinking that we know what's best for everyone. I don't know what's best for everyone. I know what's best for me, I think. But what's best for me is to treat people equitably, to believe in the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility. And I am responsible for showing respect for other people's rights. And I, if I don't respect their rights, then I should be held responsible for that misbehavior. And that is misbehavior. Well, I think I, I asked you about everything I wanted to ask and I, I did, it was really great talking with you and I'm so appreciative that you, you re, uh, on time prove it tyranny. by reading. Prove it by reading this book on tyranny, by Timothy Snyder. It's about 140 pages. It's 100. It's 126 pages, and it's the most important 126 pages you're ever going to read. It is absolutely wonderful. And he also wrote on the road to unfreedom. Timothy Snyder, get those two books and read them. And if you don't understand what's happening and how angry some black males are. And you need to read the book, Rage of a Privileged Class by Ellis Coase. And if you only read the chapter called The Dozen Demons, any white person who reads this, this book, just the, that chapter, is going to understand a whole lot about the anger that's in this, com in this country right now because of the way people are being treated. It has to be stopped. It, and, and the only thing we so-called white people can do is practice self-education. The information is out there. We have to go after it. We have to read it. We have to learn from it. But instead, we tell other people how to think and how to feel. I'm not telling you how to think and how to feel. I'm telling you how to self-educate so that you'll figure out how to think and how to feel and what it is that's wrong. 
white people had better change their behaviors quickly. They only have 30 years. They're playing catch up ball right now. We better change our behaviors and we better change them fast. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, I really appreciate this so much, getting to talk to you. And, and it really does mean so much to me that, you know, I, I know you were just on Jimmy Fallon last month. You've been on Oprah. You didn't have to do this. And, you know, wait, and wait you minute, did. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was on the Johnny Carson show 58 years ago. 58 years later, I'm on the, the in the same, I'm, I'm, talking from my house to the same area for the love of god 52 years it only yeah. took us three years to get to the moon after jfk got elected three years to get to the moon 52 years to get to the idea that it's all right not to be white think about that do i sound angry i am <laughs> you sound passionate to me but to someone else, no, that, this is passion. Um, this is anger. You might, have no idea what I'm, I'm passionate. We won't talk about that. Go on. They they might say she she sounds angry and uh, she doesn't smile enough. But that's what they say about all women with opinions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have those, but I have those based <laughs> on the thousands of books that I read. I get that information from people who know more than I do. And anybody who has children and hasn't shown their children the book, The Color of Man, is doing a bad thing to their children. The Color of Man, look at this. It's a whole bunch of little children, all different sizes and different ages and different colors, not different races, all the same race. Beautiful children, all the same race. For the love of heaven, how long will it take us to learn? Well, okay. I want to thank you again. And I, I, I hope you stay healthy, safe, and sane with, with all this COVID stuff. And I, I wish you well. And it was, it was so great getting to, to talk to you. And, and I really do appreciate it again. Did you learn anything? I did. I did. I learned a lot okay. from you. And I'm going to make sure it gets on YouTube and on social media so other people can listen to it. And, and, and learn from you also, because I think you answered a lot of questions that I haven't been able to find yet before, and some of them were current. And I think a lot of people will find what you have to say to be very informative and interesting. And I really did gain a lot from getting to hear from you, and I really do appreciate it so very much. Did I show you this book, The Racial Conditioning of Our Children? I don't think I have that one down, no. You better write that one down. Nathan Rutstein wrote The Racial Conditioning of Our Children. And the subtitle is Ending Psychological Genocide in the Schools. Read this book. Ending Psychological Genocide in the Schools. When you send a child to school and he's in good shape, by the time he's been there a year, he thinks not much of himself because he has been informed by the people in the education system that he is less than because of the color of his skin. And remember, it's not because of the color of our skin, it's because of the ignorance of people who think that skin color is an indicator or predictor of intelligence. Right, and we saw that in your study with the blue eyes and the green eyes, uh, blue eyes and brown eyes, is that when you, when you started treating people differently, they started performing worse on exams, they started performing worse in the classroom, because they were told they were dumb, they felt dumb, and they started acting dumb, because that is how the society around them in the classroom treated them. And that was what was so revealing in your, in your classroom exercises, is that when people are treated poorly, they start treating themselves poorly and feeling poorly about themselves. And I think we need some type of program like that implemented in workplaces and in schools just once one day of the year as a, as see, a training but exercise. But, but, you see, but you see, we're implementing that program in a negative way all day, every day, based on skin right. color. Yeah. I copy what happens in society in my classroom. So when I create a microcosm of society, in a third grade classroom, a boardroom, or a lecture hall, I'm only copying what we do every day in this country. And we're having exactly the same results with it that I have on a day, one day basis with my third graders. We tear people down because we'll be under the person, the black person, who acts too smart. 
even his black friends won't accept him because they'll accuse him of trying to act the point. We tear people down because of our ignorance about skin color and our desire to be on top. If you're going to keep a person in the gutter, you have to get down in the gutter with him and hold him down. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So every time you dehumanize another person, you are dehumanizing yourself because you say you, you decided not to act like a human being. Well, thank you again. I really, I really enjoyed talking to you. It was really no, you great. You, yeah. just have to, you have to listen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, uh, next time, if this ever happens again, I'll shut up more. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. No, for it was me. it was perfect. And I I never really interview people, so this was the first. And this was you were my first Zoom person ever. I've never used Zoom before today. You probably have more experience with Zoom than I do, so I'm still figuring it out. You did very, very well, and you asked very good questions, and someday I'll give you good answers. I just kind of, the minute you say one word, it goes into my head, and I think, oh, my God, this is what we're talking about. Sorry about that, yeah. but you did a good job. Thank you. I, I hope the PowerPoint was kind of helpful. I, know, I knew I was going to ask a million more questions, um, but I, hopefully that kind of gave a visual of, it got me kind of on track, but then I, I knew right right as we got into that, we were going to start talking about a lot of stuff, and and um, I I really I really thought your answers were were really revealing, and um, you know everyone might not agree, but you know there's a lot of truth in what you say when in terms of race alone. You know people might not agree with some politics stuff, but in terms of of where we are with race in, in this country, we have a lot of work to do, and. And I think your work over the years, you know, you're, you're fast becoming an icon, a civil rights icon to a lot of young people, because I've seen, I've seen your videos for, for years on my newsfeed and on Facebook. People are seeing your, your content again. And to a lot of young people, you know, we're finding out about you for the first time. And you're, you're having a great impact, more than you might know, on, on social media and on Platform. I was surprised to even hear a reply from you in my email. But, um, but you have to know that my heroes are black women. My right. heroes are black women because black women keep on keeping on. No matter what you do to them, you can't keep them down. Every black woman in this country knows more, has forgotten more since breakfast than I will ever learn about racism. And you can't stop them. They keep right on keeping on and they know... Oh, God, I'll never forget the black woman who were doing differences. And I asked the white man the questions, is your, is your gender important to you? Yeah, give her him power. Is your age important? Yeah, yeah. Is the color of your skin? Yeah, all those things are important. They all give him power. And the, the black woman, every time I'd ask her the same questions, she'd say, well, no, it doesn't give me power. No, it doesn't give me power. But there are some other issues. And finally, in that group of 200 and some heads, department heads and administrators in this major university, Somebody finally, fourth thing they said was color. And I said, are you talking about skin color or hair color? And she said, skin color. I asked this white male, is your skin color important to you? He said, I never have to think about it. I said, you never have to think about it? No. Does that mean you're really free? Yes, I am. Is there anything you fear? Nothing. And I thought, oh, you should have shut up, buddy. I'm going to make you feel bad. And I turned to this black yeah. woman and I said to her, is the color, does the color of your skin give you power? And for, she didn't say anything for a long time. And then she finally said, I'm going to say something I've never said out loud before. I said, and that's because, she said, because I'm ashamed of it. And I said, and that would be, and by now there was one tear go slowly making its way down the left side of that beautiful black woman's face. She said, I have two children. They're both girls. Both times when I was pregnant, I prayed that I wouldn't have a son. I said, and that's because, she said, because I, wouldn't, I didn't want to think what would happen to him and I didn't want to think what I would have to do when I lost him. There wasn't a sound in that audience. You could have heard a feather fall. The only sound you heard was that man going, <clears throat> and I thought, cry, you miserable SOB. If you didn't learn something from what she just said, and I said to the audience, that woman just taught you more in two minutes than I could teach you for a lifetime. And by that time, most of the women in that room were crying because it never occurred to them that we white women don't fear having a son because we know that we want to have sons because they'll carry on the family name. But that black woman and several black women have told me since then, that's absolutely right. I didn't want to have a son because I didn't want to go through that either. Not because there's something wrong with being a black male, 
but because the ignorance of this society tells black women don't have sons because we'll get them. And we can show a, a group of policemen, one of them with his knee on a black man's neck, over and over and over on television to traumatize little black kids and their mothers. We have that kind of power. We have the power what? not to reshow that over and over again. Exactly. What 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 year was this? Um, was this? Um, you said it was an audience. Was it, was it televised? Was it filmed? Or was it no, a, a no, private? It was. No. It was. Okay. A, it was. They just invited me to come in and do the. Not. I didn't do the exercise. I just spoke to them for about an hour and a half or two about two hours because we showed the film The Eye of the Storm. But I I could have stopped. After that woman said those things, I could have stopped at that point because they learned more in that few moments of what it's like, what it means to be a black woman in this society. It makes me sick when I think of it because it didn't have to happen. She, she doesn't have to feel that way. She shouldn't have to be afraid to have sons because of what, what will happen to them and what will happen to her when she loses them. What a horrible, horrible comment on our society. What a horrible statement about liberty and justice for all. And I said to the group, next time you listen to the Star Spangled Banner, comes to the last line, oh say does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave? Or the land of the free? And I pointed to this white man. And the home of the brave. That's what we're talking about in this country. I'm free. She has to be brave. For the love of God, how long are we going to do this and claim to be a Christian country? There's something very wrong here. Very, very wrong. There is. Well, I want to thank you again. I'll let you let you go, but you know, I really, I want to tell you again how much I appreciate this, and I'm going to send you an email. I'm sure thanking you again. Um, but I, I really, this really does mean a lot to me getting to talk to you and and hear your insight. Well, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Jane, and I, I okay. really love this. Okay, have a great day. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to turn this off now so I'm not tempted to talk anymore. Goodbye. <laughs> I, I, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> you know, you could listen all day. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. We hope you enjoyed this discussion and found it insightful during these conflicting times. Statements from interviewees do not necessarily reflect the views or political ideology of the host. For more details and resources from Jane, log on to janeelliot.com.